If, as the old adage has it, the first casualty of war is the truth, then it follows that the first battle of any war is won by lies. Lies have always been used to sell war to a public that would otherwise be leery about sending their sons off to fight and die on foreign soil. In times long past, this was easy enough to accomplish. A proclamation by a king or queen was enough to set the machinery of war in motion. But in the modern age of democracy and volunteer armies, a pretense for war is required to rally the nation around the flag and motivate the public to fight. That is why every major conflict is now accompanied by its own particular bodyguard of lies. From false flag attacks to dehumanization of the enemy, here are all the examples you'll need to debunk a century of war lies. This is the Corbett Report. In 1915, the RMS Lusitania, a British ocean liner en route from New York to Liverpool, was sunk by a German U-boat 11 miles off the coast of Ireland. The ship's sinking, which resulted in the death of 128 of the 139 Americans aboard, became a symbol of German evil and helped psychologically prepare the US public for their country's eventual entry into World War I. But every facet of the story of the Lusitania, as it has been presented to the public, was a deliberate lie or a lie by omission. The boat was not a purely civilian vessel carrying 3,813 40-pound unrefrigerated containers of cheese and 696 containers of butter, as the official manifest held, but gun cotton, in keeping with the shipment's stated destination, the Royal Navy's weapons testing establishment. It was not sunk by the German torpedo boat, but by secondary explosions from the munitions the ship was illegally carrying. It was not the victim of a cowardly German surprise attack. The German embassy placed a warning notice about the Lusitania in 50 American newspapers right next to Cunard's own listings. And the American ambassador to England at the time, Walter Hines Page, wrote to his son five days before the ship was sunk, asking, If a British liner full of American passengers be blown up, what will Uncle Sam do? That's what's going to happen. So what did the official cover-up of the incident conclude? That the dastardly Germans had waged a perfidious sneak attack on an innocent peace boat, of course. And the rest, as they say, is history. A little over two decades later, America's entry into World War II came when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in December 1941, killing over 2,400 American servicemen and civilians. But far from an unprovoked sneak attack, as the official government-approved history would have you believe, Pearl Harbor is best understood as a conspiracy to motivate the American public for war by first provoking and then allowing a Japanese strike on American targets. This is not even a controversial idea. It was commonly understood and discussed by many in the Roosevelt administration at the time. Henry Stimson, the U.S. Secretary of War, noted in his diary that just the week before the attack, President Roosevelt had told him, we were likely to be attacked perhaps as soon as next Monday, and then solicited Stimson's advice on how we should maneuver them, the Japanese, into the position of firing the first shot without allowing too much danger to ourselves. Around the same time, Roosevelt sent a message to all military commanders stating that the United States desires that Japan commit the first overt act. So how did FDR and his administration provoke the Japanese into attacking? In late 1940, Roosevelt ordered the United States fleet to be relocated from San Pedro to Pearl Harbor. The order incensed Admiral James Richardson, commander-in-chief of the U.S. fleet, who complained bitterly to FDR about the nonsensical decision. It left the fleet open to attack from every direction, it created a 2,000-mile-long supply chain that was vulnerable to disruption, and it packed the ships in together at Pearl Harbor, where they would be sitting ducks in the event of a bombing or torpedo raid. FDR, unable to counter these objections, went ahead with the plan and relieved Richardson of his command. Then, in June 1941, Secretary of the Interior Harold Ikes wrote a memo advising FDR to embargo Japanese oil in order to goad them into war. There might develop from the embargoing of oil to Japan such a situation as would make it not only possible but easy to get into this war in an effective way. 
Roosevelt followed three weeks later with an order seizing Japanese assets in America and effectively preventing Japan from purchasing much-needed American oil, which at that time accounted for four-fifths of Japanese oil imports. The provocations had their intended effect, and the Americans listened in on Japanese war preparations via radio. They received warnings of an imminent attack from diplomatic officials and military attaches. The attack was even predicted by the Honolulu Advertiser days before it happened. But all of these warnings were ignored. Even today, nearly 80 years after the events, new documents and memos continue to be found showing more warnings that Roosevelt and his administration deliberately ignored in the run-up to the attack. FDR got his wish. The Japanese attack was successful. 2,400 Americans died, and the nation, outraged, responded by rallying around the flag and jumping enthusiastically into war. But the Japanese themselves were no innocents when it came to lying their way into war. Ten years before Pearl Harbor, in 1931, Japan was looking for a pretext to invade Manchuria. On September 18th of that year, a lieutenant in the Imperial Japanese Army detonated a small amount of TNT along a Japanese-owned railway in the Manchurian city of Mukden. The act was blamed on Chinese dissidents and used to justify the invasion and occupation of Manchuria. When the lie was later exposed, Japan was diplomatically shunned and forced to withdraw from the League of Nations. The League of Nations fell apart precisely for its inability to prevent World War II. Its successor organization, the United Nations, engaged in its own war lies shortly after its creation to ensure that it would not meet the same fate. The Korean War, waged under the UN flag and sold to the public as a virtuous mission to save the South from the North's communist aggression, was on its face a war that should never have happened. The division of Korea into North and South was not the organic decision of the Korean people, but a plan that originated in an article in 1944 in Foreign Affairs, the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations, which suggested dividing the country up and putting its administration in the hands of the Allies, including the Soviets. When the newly founded UN put that plan into action in 1945, Korea was arbitrarily divided along the 38th parallel, with the US administering the South, and the Soviet Union administering the North. Neither was the war itself the organic result of decisions taken by the Korean people. In 1949, Owen Lattimore, a member of the Carnegie and Rockefeller-funded Institute for Pacific Relations and an advisor to the State Department on East Asian Issues, wrote, The thing to do is let South Korea fall, but not to let it look as if we pushed it. In a speech at the National Press Club the following year, Secretary of State Dean Acheson placed Korea outside of the U.S.'s defense perimeter of the Pacific, stating that any attack that took place outside of that perimeter would have to be dealt with under the Charter of the United Nations. Taking this as a green light, the North Koreans, heavily fortified and equipped with Soviet military aid, invaded the South. The war began on June 27, 1950, when the UN Security Council passed a resolution calling for members to provide military assistance to restore international peace and security in the area. The Soviet Union, being a veto-wielding member of the Council, could have vetoed the resolution and prevented the UN from engaging in the war, but they abstained from the vote altogether. When General MacArthur, leading the UN forces, managed to repel the North right to the Chinese border, he was prevented from completing the mission by Truman, who would not authorize any operations north of the Soviet-held 38th parallel unless there was no chance of confrontation with either Chinese or Soviet forces. MacArthur, shocked by this development, wrote in a letter years later, Such a limitation upon the utilization of available military force to repel an enemy attack has no precedent either in our own history or, so far as I know, in the history of the world. To me, it clearly foreshadowed the tragic situation which has since developed and left me with a sense of shock I had never before experienced in a long life crammed with explosive reactions and momentous hazards. In the end, the bloody Korean conflict ended not with a peace deal, but a ceasefire. Not with the reunification of the Korean peninsula, but with the establishment of a demilitarized zone to keep them separated. Nearly three million civilians died during the fighting, and the country was torn to pieces all in the name of a military action under the UN flag that should never have escalated into war in the first place.
In August of 1964, President Johnson was preoccupied in finding an excuse to justify a formal escalation of American military involvement in Vietnam. That excuse came on August 2nd, when the USS Maddox, a destroyer supposedly on a peaceful mission in international waters, reported a surprise attack from North Vietnamese torpedo boats in the Gulf of Tonkin. Just two days later, it reported another attack. Johnson responded by launching retaliatory strikes and signing the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, thus formally launching the Vietnam War. Years later, it was revealed that the story of the Maddox II had been a tissue of lies. The Maddox was not peacefully drifting near Vietnamese waters, minding its own business. It was part of a covert electronic warfare campaign assisting the South Vietnamese in launching attacks on the North. It had not been attacked out of the blue on August 2nd, as originally reported, but in fact had fired first. And, as even the NSA's own internal publication, made available to the public for the first time 40 years after the incident, concluded, the second attack on August 4th had never taken place at all. But these were mere details, and, just like the facts about the Lusitania and Pearl Harbor, these details were suppressed long enough for the event to have its intended effect, rallying the public for war. The Six-Day War in 1967 between Israel and Egypt, Syria, and Jordan is yet another example of a war which was justified for reasons that were later exposed as lies. When Israel launched an attack on Egypt's airfields on the morning of June 5th, they initially claimed that it was a defensive strike and that Egypt had struck first. But this was an easily proven lie, and the claim was quickly dropped. Next, they claimed that the attack was preemptive self-defense and that Egypt and its Arab allies had been preparing to strike Israel. But multiple Israeli officials, including Yitzhak Rabin, later admitted that Egypt had not been preparing a war or even interested in one. And then... In the most outrageous incident of all, Israel attempted to get America involved in the war by attacking the USS Liberty, a U.S. technical research ship collecting electronic intelligence just outside Egypt's territorial waters at the time of the war. The attack, carried out by Israeli fighter jets and torpedo boats, was relentless. The Liberty was strafed and torpedoed repeatedly, with the crew sending distress messages and even hoisting a large American flag so there could be no doubt as to their identity. The Israeli attack was finally called off an hour and a half into the assault. Israel, caught in a blatant attempt to sink an American ship, offered an apology for mistaking the identity of the vessel. But it was no mistake. In 2007, the NSA declassified intercepts confirming that the Israelis knew they were attacking an American ship, not an Egyptian ship as their cover story is maintained. Even mainstream historians now characterize Israel's attack on the Liberty as a daring ploy by Israel to fake an Egyptian attack on the American spy ship and thereby provide America with a reason to officially enter the war against Egypt. But the incident was soon memory hold, and to this day, the Six-Day War is portrayed as an act of preemptive self-defense by the valiant Israelis against the dastardly Arab aggressors. By the 1990s, the post-Vietnam public was growing increasingly wary of calls for war in far-flung corners of the world in countries many had never heard of. And so it was that in 1990, when the politicians and their deep state controllers required the American public to be motivated to wage war against Iraq for its invasion of Kuwait, they hired a literal PR firm to sell an even more brazen set of lies to Joe Sixpack and Jane Soccer Mom. The most famous of these lies revolved around Nayira, a young Kuwaiti girl who sparked international headlines for her shocking testimony before the Congressional Human Rights Caucus in October 1990. In a tear-stained speech, she told a harrowing story of the horrors she witnessed being committed by Iraqi soldiers at a Kuwaiti hospital where she was volunteering. It's the second week after an invasion, I volunteered, volunteered at the al Hospital with 12 other women who wanted to help as well. I was the youngest volunteer. The other women were from 20 to 30 years old. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers g come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators, and left the children to die on the cold floor. 
It's difficult today to understand just how important this testimony was in setting the tone of the debate about whether America should commit military forces to defend Kuwait. It was reported breathlessly on the evening news, and it was repeated by President Bush on not one or two occasions, but six separate times in the lead-up to war. Babies pulled from incubators and scattered like firewood across the floor. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. Then, when the Gulf War resolution was making its way through the House, the incubator story was raised in Congress. Now is the time to check the aggression of this ruthless dictator whose troops have bayoneted pregnant women and have ripped babies from their incubators in Kuwait. And then again in the Senate. The vote passed and combat operations formally began in January 1991. The only problem? Naira was not some anonymous Kuwaiti girl, but, as a subsequent CBC investigation discovered, she was Naira al Saba, daughter of Saud al Saba, the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States. Her testimony had been written for her by Hill and Knowlton, a PR company hired by the Kuwaiti government supported AstroTurf organization, the Citizens for a Free Kuwait, to help sell the Gulf War. And the Congressional Human Rights Caucus that held the hearing where Naira gave her testimony? It was later found to be a Hill and Knowlton front itself. As everyone knows by now, the second Gulf War in 2003 was also built on lies. We all remember the lies about Saddam's WMDs and the way that story was sold to the public by Colin Powell at the UN. But this time, the media took the driver's seat in the campaign to sell the war to the public. The New York Times led the way with Judith Miller's now infamous reporting on the Iraqi WMD story, now known to have been based on false information from untrustworthy sources. But the rest of the media quickly fell into line, with the NBC Nightly News asking, what precise threat Iraq and its weapons of mass destruction pose to America? And Time debating whether Hussein was making a good faith effort to disarm Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. Reports about chemical weapon stashes were reported on before they were confirmed, although headlines boldly asserted their existence as indisputable fact. And any media personality that showed skepticism about the claims being made, even wildly popular ones like Phil Donahue, host of MSNBC's then highest rated program, were summarily removed from the air. Scott Ritter is here, and so is Ambassador Buck. You had Scott Ritter, who, former weapons inspector, who was saying that uh, if we invade, it'll be a historic blunder. Yes, now, but we didn't have Malone. He had to be there with someone else who supported the war. In other words, you couldn't have Scott Ritter alone. You could have Richard Furl alone. You could have the conservative. You could have the supporters of the president alone. And they would say why this war is important. You couldn't have a dissenter alone. Our producers were instructed to feature two conservatives for every liberal. You're kidding. No, this is absolutely Instructed true. from above? Yes. We now know that, in fact, the stockpiles did not exist, and the administration premeditatedly lied the country into yet another war. But the most intense opposition the Bush administration ever received over this documented war crime was some polite correction on the Sunday political talk show circuit. You and a few other critics are the only people I've heard use the phrase immediate threat. I didn't. The president didn't. And uh, it's become kind of folklore that that's, that's what's happened. The president went... You're saying that nobody in the administration uh, said I, that? I can't speak for nobody and everybody in the administration and say nobody said Vice that. Vice president didn't say that? Not, Did. If you have any citations... Uh, I'd like to see him. Yeah, says some have argued that the new, this is you speaking. Some have argued that the nuclear threat from Iraq is not imminent. That Saddam is at least five to seven years away from having nuclear weapons. I would not be so certain. Mm -hmm. And and uh, close to imminent. <laughs> well, um, I, I tried to be precise and I've tried to be accurate. I'm so. No terrorist state poses a greater or more immediate threat to the security mm -hmm. of our people and the stability of the world than the regime of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Mm -hmm. The WMD story blew up in the neocons' face shortly after the war, 
but by that time they had already succeeded in their plan to reshape the Middle East. But for the would-be controllers of public opinion, a valuable lesson was learned. Human rights and protecting the innocent is a more effective lie to sell to the public to motivate them for war. So when it came time to sell the war on Libya to the public, the UN-backed NATO-led aggressors once again donned the cloak of human rights by turning to none other than the UN's Human Rights Council. The process that launched the intervention was begun by a coalition of 70 non-governmental organizations, which issued a joint letter urging the UN to suspend Libya from the Human Rights Council, and for the Security Council to invoke the so-called Responsibility to Protect principle in protecting the Libyan people from alleged atrocities being committed by the Libyan government. In a special session on the issue on February 25, 2011, the UN Human Rights Council adopted a resolution affirming the NGO's recommendations. The resolution was adopted without a vote. The Security Council immediately passed resolutions 1970 and 1973, authorizing the establishment of a no-fly zone on Libyan military aviation for the protection of civilians and the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Three days later, using the resolution as its justification, the US, UK, and France began bombing the population of Libya. Meanwhile, the International Criminal Court's chief prosecutor, Luis Moreno Ocampo, began working on the legal basis for the invasion. He drafted the request for the court's judges to issue an arrest warrant for Gaddafi for crimes against humanity. Although NATO forces were already engaged in an invasion of the country on the basis of undocumented allegations by a group of NGOs, Moreno Ocampo's request was not issued until May 16th. On June 28th, the day after the judges agreed to issue the warrant, Moreno Ocampo participated in a press conference in which one reporter asked about the evidence that Gaddafi had ever engaged in the atrocities he was accused of. I advise you to read the application of the prosecutor's office, many pages, I think it was 77 pages. We describe in detail the facts, most of it is public, and the judges also decided analyzing the evidence. So, of course, we are prosecutors and judges, so we rely on facts. So we prove the crimes. That's what we did. Although the document that Moreno Ocampo urges the public to read to understand the evidence of Gaddafi's crimes is indeed public, and is 77 pages long, the version made available to the public has been heavily redacted. In fact, of the 77 pages, 54 of them have been redacted, comprising the entire section of the document dealing with the evidence for the charges themselves. The most sickening part of this war lie is just how obvious it was. No one involved in this charade cared about the well-being of the Libyan people. Not the press. Not the politicians. Not the ICC prosecutors. And as a result, today, seven years after the destruction of Libya at the hands of the United Nations-sanctioned NATO saviors, open-air slave markets are running in the country that the human rights crusaders once pretended to care about. False flags, provocateur conflicts, fake news and fake human rights crusades. Throughout the last century, a host of methods have been employed to keep the public playing the military-industrial complex's game. And over that century, the blood of untold millions has flowed as a direct result of these war lies. Truth is the first casualty of war, as they say. But if we desire peace, then we must confront the liars with our knowledge of these war lies. And armed with this truth, the public finally stands a chance of stopping the next war before the warmongers can conjure it into existence. In November 2017, journalist Vanessa Beely gave a groundbreaking presentation to the Swiss Press Club in Geneva on the so-called Syria Civil Defense, better known as the White Helmets, which bills itself as an impartial group of volunteer search and rescue workers working to save lives and strengthen communities in Syria. In her presentation, Beely demonstrated the connections between this supposedly neutral organization, recognized terrorist groups operating in Syria, and the UK government. During my time working in East Aleppo, it was clear that the councils were working hand in hand with Nusra Front. Their centres in each district were always next door to Nusra Front headquarters and White Helmet centres, i.e. they always formed an integrated complex. 
Less than three weeks later, The Guardian released a report painting all skeptics of the White Helmets, including Beely and other anti-imperialist activists, as proponents of a Russian propaganda campaign directed by the Kremlin. This is no coincidence. The White Helmets are in fact part of a coordinated propaganda campaign. But that campaign is not being directed by the Kremlin, but the Western governments which have been responsible for the founding and funding of the White Helmets. And the ones promoting that propaganda are not independent journalists like Beely, but establishment mouthpieces like The Guardian. In Syria, they know how to intervene. They know how to manipulate the media. We had the White Helmets, a complete propaganda construct in Syria. They end up getting an Academy Award. They know how to intervene in in public discourse every day, and in politics every day. The White Helmets are a propaganda construct. This is the Corbett Report. And the Oscar goes to... Okay, the White Helmets. It's quite appropriate that a propaganda documentary honoring the work of the White Helmets won an Oscar at the 2017 Academy Awards. This is, after all, an organization that thrives on the magic of movie making to make themselves into heroes. Surely any movie that could turn a group funded by the US and UK governments, associated with Western intelligence operatives, and embedded with Al-Qaeda terrorists into a group of crusading heroes is as worthy of an Academy Award as any similarly fictitious movie about superheroes saving the world. It was also fitting that the leader of the group, Riyad Saleh, was not at the ceremony to help accept the prize as originally planned. Hi, um, it's for NPR. I'm wondering, um, I thought the white helmets were going to be here, or the leader and the cinematographer who shot a lot of this film. What happened? Well, uh, Riyad Salah, he, who's the leader of the White Helmets, um, he couldn't come in the end because um, the, uh, the last couple of days in Syria, the violence has really escalated, and he does life-saving work. Our cinematographer, I mean, you know, we're, we're confused about this too. The last two weeks have been very difficult. He had a US visa, he tried to board a plane, and, um, and he wasn't able to come. So, we, you know, we're, we're very sad about that. What Orlando von Einsiedel, the director of the film, neglected to mention is that this was not the first time that Raid Saleh, the leader of the White Helmets, failed to appear in the U.S. In April of 2016, Interaction, an alliance of NGOs, held a gala dinner in Washington where it planned to honor Saleh and the work of the White Helmets in Syria. However, Saleh was refused entry into the country when he arrived at Washington's Dulles Airport. Declining to talk about the details of the case, a State Department spokesman merely said, The U.S. government's system of continual vetting means that traveler records are screened against available information in real time. You commend this group, you're going to continue to support them, and yet you revoked the visa of their leader? I don't, that makes zero sense to me. So, uh, a couple responses. One is, uh, unfortunately, we can't speak to uh, individual visa cases. Um, I think broadly speaking, though, uh, on any indivi- on any uh, visa case, uh, uh, we are constantly looking at new information, uh, uh, so-called continually vetting uh, uh, travel or records. Uh, and if we do have new information that we believe uh, this uh, an individual, let me finish, would, would pose a security risk, uh, we'll certainly act on that. I'm saying it, it just strikes me as a bit odd that you're saying that this group is wonderful and does such a great job and you're commending them for their heroism, and yet this you're doing this uh, just 10 days after the leader of this group, who was supposed to be, you know, who got his visa revoked and wasn't allowed to travel here. Well, he's one individual in the group. Um, but the leader of the group. And any, any individual, again, I'm broadening my language here for specific reasons, but any individual in any group... Uh, suspected of uh, ties or uh, relations with extremist groups uh, or that we had believed to be a security threat to the United States, we would act accordingly. But that does not, by extension, mean we condemn or uh, would cut off ties to the, the group for which that individual works for. 
So how is this possible? How could the leader of such a valiant team of crusading do-gooders himself be denied a visa to enter the United States as a potential security threat with ties to terrorists? The multi-million dollar PR campaign that surrounds the White Helmets, after all, portrays the group as being pure as the driven snow. This is the call to work for the brave members of the Syrian Civil Defense, an ad hoc grassroots first response unit within rebel-held Syria. Nicknamed the White Helmets, they rush towards the scene of a bombing to save victims, many of whom are trapped under rubble. Once tailors, bakers, pharmacists, these 3,000 ordinary Syrian men and some women, now unwitting heroes. So who are these heroic volunteers? The White Helmets is the unofficial name for the Syrian Civil Defense, a rescue organization made up entirely of volunteers who operate in opposition-controlled Syria. According to their own data, the group have rescued more than 58,000 people, including Omran Daknish, who painfully reminded the world of the horrors unfolding in Syria every day. The task of these modern-day war heroes is extremely dangerous. To date, around 130 White Helmet volunteers have been killed in the country's relentless civil war. One of the group's most notable losses happened in August when an airstrike killed the White Helmet volunteer who miraculously rescued a baby who'd been trapped under rubble for 16 hours. Ra'ad Saleh and Farooq al-Habib are joining us today from in and around Syria. They represent the civil defense forces, what the Syria campaign has come to introduce as the White Helmets. We often heard over the past three and a half years of covering the conflict, who are the good guys in Syria? It's such a mess. They are the good guys. But what is always left out of these glowing mainstream media puff pieces is any actual information about the organization. Where did it come from? Who founded it? Where does it get its funding? And why does it operate exclusively in terrorist-held areas of Syria? The first clues about the real nature of the group comes from their name itself. Calling themselves the Syria Civil Defense is misleading in multiple ways. First, it implies that the group was founded in Syria by Syrians. It was not. The group was in fact founded in March 2013 in Turkey by James Lemazurier, a former British military intelligence officer then doing contract work for the US and UK governments. None of this information is even controversial. This is the story, as told by Le Missourier himself, at a conference in Lisbon in 2015. In early 2013, I had a meeting with nine uh, local leaders that had come out from northern Aleppo. And they painted this picture of the frequency and the intensity of the bombing that was taking place. And I was delivering programs on behalf of the US and UK government and we were able to offer them some good governance training, some democratization training, and a handful of sat phones. Several days later, I was very fortunate um, to meet the, uh, the head of Turkey's earthquake response group, uh, a group of people called Akut. And the conversation that we had was along the lines of, if they can rescue people as a result of a building that's been flattened as a result of an earthquake, how possible is it to rescue people from a building that's been collapsed as a result of a bomb? And this led to a series of design labs. Um, we brought a number of people out of Syria who brought building samples. Um, and we sat down over several days, merging the expertise of the Syrians that had come out from the ground, who knew the regime tactics, um, with my organization that understood operating in war zones, and the expertise of this organization, Akut, who rescue people after earthquakes. The name Syria Civil Defense is also a lie because there is a real Syria Civil Defense that has been operating in the country for 65 years. The actual Syria Civil Defense, a volunteer search and rescue organization, was established in Syria in 1953. Unlike the White Helmets, the real Syria Civil Defense is a member of the International Civil Defense Organization and, again in contrast to the White Helmets, has an emergency number 
that can be called in Syria by those needing assistance. But this Syria civil defense does not enjoy the glitz and glamour of Oscar-winning documentaries, the constant attention of the international press, or the more than $60 million in funding by foreign governments that have been bestowed on the White Helmets. Do you know who finances them, how they operate, who are they supported by, what kind of organization they have? How do you get your information well, from um, them and so on? Well, I can say I mean, we, we provide we them with... A bit. Well, well, I can tell you that we yeah. provide, through USAID, about right. $23 million in assistance right. uh, to them. But they are fantastically brave, uh, these White Helmets. I'm proud to say we're giving them uh, another, I think, £32 million of funding as part of a wider uh, £65 million package for a non-humanitarian aid. Now, I would like to come back to the funding of the White Helmets in a little more detail. Um, my colleague here covered it um, in general. But I would like to focus on the UK Foreign Office and the use of the Conflict Stability and Security Fund to support and finance the Syrian opposition and the White Helmets. The UK regime is a primary player in the US coalition and in its operations inside Syria. Following a recent parliamentary question from Baroness Caroline Cox, it has been confirmed that the UK Foreign Office has financed the Syrian opposition almost £200 million over three years through this conflict fund. However, the British government has so far refused to release the names of the recipients. During my time in East Aleppo in 2016-17 and with Syrian journalist Khaled Iskaif, while searching the, the council office, the local council offices, we found and translated documents in Arabic that referred to two UK organizations, Adam Smith International and Integrity Global. Both organizations are funded by the UK Foreign Office via this conflict fund to offer assistance to the Syrian opposition. And this has been achieved via a variety of outreach agents, one of whom is the Tamkeen Project, which claims to build resilience in Syrian communities and which establishes, funds and supports the local councils in terrorist-held areas such as East Aleppo and Idlib. Tamkeen was responsible for the financing and maintenance of the East Aleppo councils. According to Britta Hagi Hassan, self-professed mayor of Aleppo, in an interview with The Guardian, the program provided East Aleppo City Council with £820,000 in May 2016. During my time working in East Aleppo, it was clear that the councils were working hand-in-hand -hand with Nusra Front. Their centres in each district were always next door to Nusra Front headquarters and White Helmet centres, i.e. they always formed an integrated complex. But even more disturbing than the unusual founding or clandestine funding of the group is the mountain of evidence demonstrating that the White Helmets, far from their official claim to political neutrality, are in fact intimately embedded with known and listed terrorist organizations in Syria. Again, the most damning evidence in this regard is not controversial in the slightest. It comes directly from the White Helmets themselves. Numerous videos and photos have surfaced showing the White Helmets parading on the dead bodies of Syrian government forces and flying the flags of known terrorist organizations. An in-depth report on the Syrian war blog last year examined the social media profiles of 65 different White Helmet-connected figures and found numerous posts in support of ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra, Arar al-Sham, and other listed terrorist organizations. Some even posted pictures of themselves with known terrorist leaders or waving the flag of terrorist groups like ISIS, and many proudly displayed images of dead Syrian soldiers. Most incredible of all is the footage of the White Helmets attending the executions of Syrian civilians and soldiers by terrorist groups, moving in to cart the dead bodies away mere seconds after the victims are brutally slain. Most of this evidence is explained away as bad apples in the organization acting on their own. Some of these bad apples are then castigated in public displays, like when one White Helmet was fired when footage surfaced showing him disposing the mutilated corpses of Syrian government fighters. When a graphic video of the White Helmets overseeing the execution of a man in terrorist-occupied Daraa surfaced last year, the group actually defended the workers while acknowledging that they, quote, did not fully uphold the strict principle of neutrality and impartiality. But incredibly, James Le Mesurier, 
the former British intelligence officer who founded the White Helmets in 2013, defended the workers caught in one bloody video from May 2015. The Middle Ground, a Singaporean website, ran a story last year featuring Le Miserier's take on the incident. But what about the damning video from May 6, 2015? The article reads, White Helmet volunteers were caught on tape running in to clear a body seconds after a gunman executed a man. It turns out that the deceased was tried and sentenced to death in a local Sharia court, said Mr. Miserier. When his father found out about the time of execution, he called the White Helmets to help him conduct a proper burial. Besides, the gunman was clad in a balaclava, not a White Helmet. Accusing the White Helmets of this act would be akin to accusing Joseph of Arimathea of crucifying Jesus. In opposition to the deafening mainstream media silence over this incredible mountain of evidence against the White Helmets stand only a handful of independent researchers, universally ignored, castigated, or marginalized from the mainstream discussion on the issue. These independent researchers include Vanessa Beely, a British researcher who has been one of the few journalists to report extensively on the ground in areas like East Aleppo over the last two years, and Eva Bartlett, a Canadian blogger who has gained notoriety for using her own on-the-ground reporting from Syria to speak out against the mainstream narrative about the White Helmets. And the majority of the evidence against the White Helmets comes from the White Helmets themselves, from their own videos, their own videos of them participating in the executions of both civilians and Syrian Arab army prisoners of war, for which crimes they are sacked, by the way. You know, none of their sponsors at that point are held accountable for their crimes against the Syrian people and against the Syrian army that is defending the Syrian people and that comes from the Syrian people. So um, Rod Saleh, who's the White Helmets leader, isn't allowed in the U.S. He was denied entry to the U.S. Um, for his questionable ties to extremists. And that, that's actually from the State Department's Mark Toner. Um, and then the White Helmets leader in um, Idlib, uh, Moaya Hassan Aga, um, he, he was somebody that is a rogue element. And he, um, he was uh, apparently involved in an execution, or he was, at, at, um, he was there at an execution of two prisoners of war in Aleppo. And he was supposedly fired from the White Helmets, but then he later reappeared with White Helmets. So um, he's a leader. You know, and so these are not rogue. Again, there's there's um, a number of people that have compiled photos showing over 60 White Helmets members, their social media posts um, with them, either, um, you know, black flags, Al Qaeda flags, ISIS flags, holding weapons or them even in White Helmets uniforms holding weapons and them in uniforms at, you know, Al Qaeda cheering rallies with black flags flying all over the place. So these are clearly not rogue. Given that there are so few voices speaking up against the White Helmets, it should come as no surprise that when The Guardian finally deigned to address what they termed the conspiracy theories about the organization, they turned their attention on these very researchers. In How Syria's White Helmets Became Victims of an Online Propaganda Machine, The Guardian turned to Olivia Solon to dismiss all opposition to the White Helmets as the work of anti-imperialist activists, conspiracy theorists, and trolls with the support of the Russian government. The choice of Solon to report on this story is especially odd. A technology reporter in San Francisco, Solon has no background of any sort in geopolitics or combat zone reporting and, as far as can be determined, has never set foot in Syria. Instead, she relied exclusively on sources such as the murky PR lobbying firm, the Syria Campaign, to praise the White Helmets and castigate their detractors. Bizarrely, the report devotes a great deal of attention to the White Helmet's Mannequin Challenge video, footage of an admittedly fake and staged rescue operation released by the group in an attempt to cash in on a viral internet video trend taking place at the time. The inference of the video is obvious, that the group is perfectly capable of staging incredibly realistic and completely fake rescue operations at any time. These fake videos, stripped of their context, would be uncritically promoted as authentic by mainstream outlets like The Guardian in the exact same way that the completely fictitious video of a Syrian boy rescuing his sister under sniper fire was uncritically accepted by the mainstream media, until it was admitted to be a fake video produced in Malta by a Norwegian film crew to, quote, 
see how the media would respond to such a video. The Guardian's headline when the fake Norwegian film production was released? Syrian boy saves girl from army sniper video. Strangely, Solon's report does not mention that incident. The majority of the Guardian's report focuses on why the innocent and virtuous white helmets would be so viciously attacked by independent journalists and how all opposition to the group is connected to the Kremlin. This is supposedly demonstrated in an utterly meaningless infographic of colored dots showing precisely nothing of substance. Unsurprisingly, Solon's contact with the reporters whose work she was set to impugn displayed her biases from the very start. In early October, I received an email. I don't think I noticed it right away, but anyway, when I did, essentially, it was an email from this Olivia Salon um, who contributes to The Guardian and is based in um, um, San Francisco, California, saying that she'd love to interview me for a story she was doing um, imminently. Um, and as I said, I didn't see the email right away, so she sent another email within the next day or so again, asking some questions about, you know, my stance on the white helmets, if I believe they were, um, you know, actors, I, I can pull up the exact email, and I think you've seen a, a, a rebuttal I did on global research, which actually includes screenshots of our conversation. Anyway, um, the, the question she posed to me um, indicated that she didn't have an honest intent in investigating the white helmets. Um, and in fact, you know, given that she contributes to The Guardian, albeit from California, um, not from Syria, uh, but The Guardian itself has constantly, um, consistently, I should say, spewed war propaganda on Syria. Um, you know, just that factor alone would make one pause and think, like, what's the objective of this article? But then the questions, um, have I received any gifts from Assad or from Syria and Russia or North Korea? She noticed with interest that I had been to North Korea recently. How is it possible to go to Syria and North Korea, given that they're both so darn controlled? You know, and when I get those kind of claims, I refer back to a blog post I, I very quickly like typed out um, last year or so. Those of us who report accurately in Syria, something like that, are Russian propagandists. Anyway, this is a segue, but the whole point being, um, anybody can apply for a visa at the Syrian embassy in Beirut. You do have to wait a while. I've had to wait over a month on many occasions. And you pay a fee and then you go to Syria. You, you arrange your transportations. And in fact, had I been reporting for The Guardian, probably I would assume that all my expenses and all of that would have been taken care of by that institution, that corporate institution. Anyway, so her questions um, were very leading. She had a predetermined story, as she called it. And I wonder, you know, as another aside, if her use of the word story was to kind of um, take away from the fact that she wasn't actually going to insert any truth in it, it was just a story. Uh, and so basically after seeing her questions, I just replied to her something like, I'm not interested in participating in your already predetermined script. You know, my colleague uh, Vanessa Bealy received a, a similar email around the same time um, with similar questions, some slightly catered to Vanessa's own background. Um, and she did reply more in depth. Oh, well, I mean, Olivia Solon contacted myself and Ava Bartlett pretty much at the same time. And she sent a list um, from memory of about 20 questions, all of which were basically asking myself and Ava to defend um, our position and the evidence that we'd uh, collated over, a, you know, a couple of years. For me, certainly three years or now four years investigating the White Helmet organization. Um, both um, remotely and inside Syria on the ground. Um, so it was it was very much an attempt to put us in a position of having to defend ourselves. And I think both of us quite rightly took the position that look, we're not here to defend ourselves. You should be defending the evidence against this organization instead of providing a blanket promotional um, report on this organization, which is what The Guardian has specifically done, of course, um, since the creation of this organization. You know, in 2016, it lobbied effectively for the White Helmets to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And when it was inundated with negative comment, it simply closed comments. So, you know, The Guardian, which itself is embedded um, in the corporate neocolonialist um, structure in the UK. I mean, it's it's owned um, by Scott Trust Limited. It gets the majority of its um, ad revenue from HSBC, 
that is not only the Swiss banking part of HSBC that has been um, basically uh, prosecuted for fraud, but also has been also found guilty um, of fraud against um, consumers in the UK. So, you know, this is already a sort of an interesting background to The Guardian. Um, and hardly surprising then, of course, that they're supporting the the sort of humanitarian, in inverted commas, war concept that is always the driver behind particularly UK foreign office um, policy in the region. Um, so Solon approached us with these questions. We both went back and basically said we have no interest in defending ourselves. And then, of course, she went out to um, fundamentally all of those entities, organizations and individuals who support fund, finance, and do the PR for the White Helmets, such as the Syria campaign, which incidentally, two days later, produced a 46-page report in which, again, I'm described as the queen of disinformation. And even in that 46 pages, they do not address one element of the evidence against the White Helmets. Researchers like Beely, Bartlett, and Professor Tim Anderson, also mentioned in Solon's report, are easy enough targets for The Guardian. Independent journalists taking it upon themselves to counter the Syria narrative, they would never be taken seriously by establishment media circles in the first place. Curiously omitted from the Guardian article, however, are the award-winning, internationally respected journalists who have similarly expressed skepticism about the White Helmets, their backers, and the PR campaign that surrounds them. There is Gareth Porter, the award-winning journalist who has contributed to foreign policy, foreign affairs, The Nation, Al Jazeera, Salon, the Huffington Post, Alternate, and countless other outlets, who wrote How a Syrian White Helmet's Leader Played Western Media in November 2016. There is Philip Giraldi, a former CIA counterterrorism specialist and military intelligence officer who wrote The Fraud of the White Helmets in July of 2017. There is Stephen Kinzer, former New York Times correspondent and, ironically, current contributor to The Guardian, who tweeted his congratulations to Al-Qaeda and Syrian jihadists when the film about their PR outfit, The White Helmets, won the Oscar. And, of course, there is John Pilger, one of the most respected and celebrated journalists and documentarians of the past half century. In Syria, they know how to intervene. They know how to manipulate the media. We had The White Helmets, a complete propaganda construct in Syria. They end up getting an Academy Award. They know how to intervene in, in public discourse every day and in politics every day. It is unclear whether Solon and The Guardian believe Porter, Giraldi, Kinzer, and Pilger to be anti-imperialist activists, conspiracy theorists, or trolls with the support of the Russian government. But the issue here is not merely one of PR and propaganda as appalling as the uncritical reporting about the White Helmets has been. What is worrying is that the so-called Syrian civil defense is, as we have seen, not Syrian at all. Founded, funded, and promoted by foreign governments, foreign contractors, and foreign lobbyists and PR agencies, the White Helmets are not a spontaneous Syrian search and rescue operation, but a template. A template that, if successful, can and will be employed anywhere and everywhere that those same foreign powers want to destabilize targeted governments in the future. But I think what is interesting, why is this organization being protected to such an extent? I think it's because um, the imperialist apparatus is defending the concept. We've already seen James Lemazurier recruiting in Brazil. We know that the White Helmets have appeared um, in Malaysia and in Venezuela and in the Philippines. So, you know, because this went through my head so many times, these are only 3,000 really criminals and thugs that have sort of emerged from the terrorist ranks or the free Syrian army moderate extremist ranks to become the White Helmets in order to get paid to continue doing the same job, but under a different auspice. Why are they being so heavily protected? But but I think it's more to do with the concept. It's more to do with the importance of this concept going forward. As James LeMessurier Le said very recently, who would you trust more than the fire brigade or a first response NGO? You know, there you have it. That's the key to why this group is so important. 
In the end, the point is no more that we should uncritically accept every statement made in opposition to the White Helmets than that we should uncritically accept every statement made in their favor. The point is that in a world where people were concerned about the real truth of the matter, we would not be forced to rely on the on-the-ground reports of Beely, Bartlett, and the handful of other independent journalists who actually bother to visit Syria and talk to actual Syrians about what is happening in their country. In such a world, there would be many different journalists, researchers, and citizens, all trying to get to the bottom of what was really happening in the country. But we do not live in such a world, and one thing is perfectly clear. We cannot rely on outlets like The Guardian and their fellow travelers like BBC News, Channel 4, CNN, and other mainstream establishment outlets to report the truth on these matters. So I wasn't really aware of Olivia Salon prior to her having contacted me, so I wasn't following her on Twitter. However, um, after the article came out, I realized I found that first her um, Twitter account was closed to comments, and then it was opened, but people like myself were blocked from commenting. And um, she was uh, seemingly outraged at one point that you know we went ahead and, and made our own statements and rebuttals without having the courtesy of sending her an email even though we were the subject of her smear piece. Uh, and um, the other thing is, yeah, the Guardian comment section is closed, except on social media. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't look at the Guardian that much, um, except when I want to prove how they're lying. So I'm not aware of if that's been their policy for a while, if that's a new thing. Um, I do notice that um, at the bottom of many of their articles, there's a plea for donations for honest investigative journalism. And I say, yes, definitely support honest investigative journalism, but you won't find it on the Guardian. Olivia Solon was contacted for comment on this report, but she did not respond to the request. And the Oscar goes to the White Helmets. So it dawned on me at the end of last year that I'd never used the Twitter poll function. And I thought to myself, what better way to use the poll function than to engage in that holy sacrament of the statist religion, selection. I mean, election. Yes, have a vote. The real power is not in voting harder. The real power is in taking matters into your own hand, deciding what you will do each and every day. You vote every single day with how you choose to spend your time, what you spend your money on, who you spend, uh, who you befriend and who you shun. All of that is your vote that you make every day. And those are the votes that matter, not casting ballots for a politician. Anyway, I'll leave the link in the show notes from the sunny climes of Western Japan. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com.